Prohibition, the period between 1920 and 1933 during which the production and sale of alcohol was forbidden in the United States, didn't do much to keep America sober, but it did do a lot of damage to the brewery and distillery industry. However, a handful of breweries found clever ways to keep their doors open, using a combination of foresight, finances, and good old-fashioned luck. So today, we're tapping the keg on some breweries who defied prohibition. Before we get started, be sure to subscribe to the Weird History Food Channel. After that, please leave a comment and let us know what other periods of American history you would like to hear about. Okay, hope you remember the secret knock. If you can't beat them, become a processed cheese spread company. That's what Wisconsin's Pabst Brewing Company was thinking when it struck the word brewing from its name and started producing a cheese spread called Pabstet. The brewery, which was founded way back in 1844, the same year Samuel Morse sent the first electric telegram, had ice cellars that were useful for aging the spread. And the product itself turned out to be highly popular in a state known for being a cheese powerhouse. Because variety is the spice of life, the spread came in two types of packages. The basic round package, which kind of looked like a tobacco tin, and a two-pound economy loaf. Amusingly, PBR's history page dryly observes that many customers likely enjoyed Papset with beer, which was just as plentiful as Prohibition law was unpopular. In addition to cheese spread, Pap's company also made soft drinks and sold malt extract in an attempt to pull in extra cash. There's no word on whether the cheese spread or the soft drinks ever won any ribbons, blue or otherwise, but when the 21st Amendment repealed Prohibition in 1933, Pap sold its cheese business to Kraft and went right back to brewing its famous Blue Ribbon beer. Pap's Blue Ribbon! This little old Pottsville, Pennsylvania brewery, built in 1829, owns the bragging rights to being the single oldest operating brewery in the United States. So how did the people behind Yingling survive Prohibition to achieve that longevity? Well, they did it in part by switching their product to near beer and offering a few different varieties, including the Yingling Special, Yingling Porter, and Yingling Juvo. Switching from beer to near beer is kind of a no-brainer, but as you might imagine, America's appetite for getting near drunk just wasn't quite the same. Making up the shortfall would mean having to add to the product line, so Yingling decided to go into the ice cream business. The beer company opened the Yingling Dairy right across the street from its brewery works and started churning out ice cream and other dairy products. Yingling spun it off after Prohibition to renew its focus on beer, but Yingling Dairy kept on going all the way until 1985. At that point, the company folded, but since you can't keep good ice cream down, the Yingling Dairy scooped itself out of retirement in 2014. Anheuser-Busch, which is today known as Anheuser-Busch InBev, also decided that the ice cream business would be a cool lifeboat for surviving the national dry spell. With its existing fleet of refrigerated beer trucks, Anheuser-Busch had no trouble keeping its new product from melting during transportation. Like the folks over at Pabst Blue Ribbon, Anheuser-Busch also experimented with various types of soft drinks and non-alcoholic malt beverages. The company eventually boasted more than 25 totally legal products in its Prohibition portfolio. These included a malt beverage called Bevo, which sort of sounds like a drunk ventriloquist dummy. <laughs> Anheuser-Busch actually released Bevo before Prohibition in anticipation of the alcohol ban. But what really delivered Anheuser-Busch from the jaws of corporate death was yeast. Realizing people were breaking the law and just brewing their own beer at home, the company slyly started selling the raw products necessary for just an activity. Hey, we can't help it if consumers want to use these ingredients to make beer. Wink wink, nudge nudge. Adolf Coors was born in 1847, long before the name Adolf got ruined for everyone. So please, cut him some slack. As the founding father of the Adolf Coors Brewing and Manufacturing Company, Coors was a savvy businessman who, like other Prohibition survivors, knew the value in diversification. From his earliest days in Golden, Colorado, Coors has had his hands in a variety of business ventures and investments. For example, his involvement with John Harold, who started the Harold Pottery and China Company, which specialized in art pottery and laboratory ceramics, would pay off in a big way. Harold left Golden in 1915, and Adolf Coors Jr. took over the pottery company as manager, renaming it Coors Porcelain Company. As World War I raged, the demand for ceramic labware kept the Coors empire afloat during Prohibition. Coors Porcelain kept going strong after beer became legal again and still exists in the 21st century as Coors Tech. 
Even though the Miller Brewing Company tried a lot of the same tricks as its competitors, including changing its name and rolling out a new line of non-alcoholic products, it still almost went flat. In response to Prohibition, the company split itself into two branches, the Miller Products Company and the Miller High Life Company. Ooh, High Life! From there, they started pumping out new offerings like Miller Special Brew, Verifine Lemon Soda, Tonic, Dry Ginger Ale, and Hardo Barley Malt Syrup. But by 1925, it was pretty clear that nothing was selling enough to keep the brewer afloat, and it very nearly went under for good. It was even put up for sale at one point, but it was so much trouble at the time that nobody wanted to buy it. They literally couldn't give the Miller Brewing Company away. Luckily, it managed to scrape by on an investment income from government securities, bonds, property management, mortgage loans, and real estate. Eventually, they outlasted Prohibition and went back into the beer business, and it's been Miller time ever since. The Minhaus Brewery was established as the Monroe Brewery in Monroe, Wisconsin in 1845. That makes it the oldest operating brewery in the Midwest and the second oldest in the United States after Yingling. Adam Bloomer Sr. changed its name to Bloomer Brewing Company in 1906, and Adam's son Fred took charge in 1918. Unfortunately for Fred, Prohibition took charge two years later. That's kind of like your graduation present breaking down on the way to prom. To make ends meet, the company changed names yet again, this time to Bloomer Products Company. Now, products covers a lot more ground than brewing, so with the name change, the company also shifted its focus to making pretty much anything but beer. And we do mean anything. Bloomer Products Company produced everything from ice cream to case tractors and road machinery. It also started brewing Bloomer's Golden Glow Near Beer, which turned out to be so popular that its name was officially changed to the surprisingly catchy Bloomer's Golden Glow Real Beer after Prohibition was repealed. Similar to how World War II actually helped bring the Great Depression to an end, World War I helped a lot of struggling breweries survive the less-than-great Prohibition. Many Prohibition-era breweries and distilleries took advantage of the dye famine created by World War I and transformed themselves into dye manufacturers to stay alive. Believe it or not, the infrastructure and equipment involved in producing beer and liquor are very similar to what is required for dye production. So the move to dye was kind of a happy accident. One brewery to make such a transformation was the Lion Brewery in New York. After completing the appropriate modifications to its brewery works and reversing the word lion in its name for some reason, the company returned to business as the Noyle Chemical and Color Works and started crafting a wide variety of dyes. After Prohibition, Noyle moved the dye manufacturing operations to a new location, and the Lion Brewery roared back into its main business with pride. Like a lot of other enterprising and morally flexible breweries, Valentin Blatz avoided bankruptcy by simply selling the stuff needed to make beer at home. Specifically, it sold hopped malt extract, which you can turn into beer by adding yeast and water. As we mentioned before, Anheuser-Busch was already selling yeast, and water came out of any tap, so home brewing during Prohibition wasn't all that hard. So how did they get away with it? Well, malt extract like that sold by Valentin Blatz wasn't actually advertised as a home brewing ingredient, even if everyone knew that's what it was for. Instead, it was marketed as a health tonic and baking ingredient. According to a 1929 news article from Lima, Ohio, the label on at least one of these malt extract cans read, For bread making, use one half as many tablespoons of malt extract as formerly used of sugar. This will make the bread light and perfectly browned. The implied wink here could probably be seen from space. The article also noted that enough malt extract is sold each week in Lima to provide the necessary sweetening for 800,000 loaves of bread or more than 16 loaves for every man, woman, and child. Boy, they sure were baking a lot of bread in Lima. There are three ways to do something the legal way, the illegal way, and the Weidemann Brewery way, which is the same as the illegal way, only bolder. The Weidemann Brewery in Newport, Kentucky preferred to break the law rather than make any real changes to their product. So, like a surprising number of breweries across the country, it just ignored prohibition and kept right on brewing bootleg beer. Apparently, that was an option. The Weidemann Brew House was raided in 1927 by federal agents, who found an impressive 3,500 barrels of beer just sitting around waiting to be shipped. The feds also found the brewery's records, which indicated that Weidemann's prohibition production was about 50,000 barrels a year. We're, uh, not sure why they kept writing that down for the feds to find. It's not like they were filing the correct taxes that year. 
The government predictably seized the brewery, and the IRS slapped it with a fairly hefty tax evasion charge, which, if you recall your Kevin Costner movies, is the same way they got Al Capone. But when Capone went to jail, the case against Weidemann Brewery took a big hit when the feds involved in the bust turned out to be corrupt. The brewery was later returned to Weidemann, for a price, of course, and, after Prohibition, went back into production for another 50 years as one of the only six post-Prohibition breweries to revive its operations in the Cincinnati area. Who says crime doesn't pay? Some breweries obeyed the law, some breweries broke the law, and some breweries said, why choose? Take, for example, the wily people at Shell's Brewery. Upstairs, the brewery stayed 100% legit, with offerings that included near beer, soft drinks, and candy. But beneath the surface, and we mean that literally, was a different story. According to Shell's history page, down in the basement was a place for the owners to keep their sanity. Which is to say, they sat down there with friends and patrons and got absolutely hammered. The kind of drunk that damages furniture. Amusingly, it was one of Shell's allegedly legal products that actually got it into trouble. They got busted for brewing near beer that was just a little bit too high in alcohol content. Shells, who were unlikely to admit they were purposefully selling regular beer as near beer, claimed the offending product had simply been forgotten and allowed to ferment for too long. And sure, it could have happened that way. You just wicked. No, I didn't. In any case, the authorities seemed willing to buy it, and they let Shells off the hook. Luckily, they didn't bother to check the basement. Like a lot of distilleries, Jim Beam was able to stay afloat during Prohibition due to a nice little loophole in Prohibition law, the exception for the use of medicinal liquor. Yes, that was a thing. For three bucks, one could legally buy a prescription for medical liquor that allowed for a pint of booze every 10 days. For some mysterious reason, prescriptions for medicinal alcohol spiked from 1920 to 1933. One such prescription read, take three ounces every hour for stimulant until stimulated. Whatever you say, Doc. The Jim Beam Company paused its U.S. distilling operations during Prohibition, but the Beam family definitely didn't stop making bourbon. One of the Beams moved to Canada and worked a distillery there until Prohibition ended, at which point he immediately returned to Kentucky. Another Beam packed up his family and went to Mexico, presumably to visit his friend Jose. So what do you think? Which brewery's Prohibition strategies impress you the most? Let us know in the comments below, and while you're at it, check out some of these other videos from Weird History Food.